For a case of chest pain, using our mnemonic Old Carts is our guide, we want to know the onset, or when did the chest pain begin? Did it come on suddenly, or was it gradually over time? For the location, we'll ask our patient to point with one finger. For duration, we want to know if the chest pain is constant or intermittent. If it is intermittent, we'd like to know the frequency. How long does it occur, and how many times a day is it occurring? We could also note the progression. Does the chest pain seem to be getting worse over time? To help us characterize the pain, we'd like to know if it's occurring at rest or with exertion, aggravating and alleviating factors, any radiation, treatments tried, and severity on a scale of 1 to 10. For all cases, we order a CBC, serum electrolytes, chest x-ray, EKG, troponins, CPK, and a lipid panel. For, un for stable angina, the classic presentation is chest pain that is substernal, exertional, and alleviated by rest or nitro. It will radiate to the left arm and can have a history of hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, or family history. We'll add an exercise stress test. Acute coronary syndrome includes both unstable angina and myocardial infarction, and that could be a non-ST elevated or an ST elevation. In unstable angina, the chest pain will also be substernal and exertional, but now we could see it occurring at rest or worsening. And worsening is very important. For example, the chest pain can still be alleviated at rest, but now it is occurring more frequently or with an increased severity, such as after two flights of stairs instead of the regular five. The pain can also radiate to the left arm, and the patient can have a history of hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, or a family history. We'll add to the workup an echocardiogram or cardiac catheterization. In myocardial infarction, the patient will also have substernal chest pain that's exertional, at rest, or worsening, but now he'll have a positive troponin. On an OSCE, we are usually not given the troponins. Therefore, it will be safe to include both an unstable angina and an MI for chest pain that's at rest or worsening. An MI pain will also radiate to the left arm, have a history of hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, or family history, and we will add an echocardiogram and cardiac catheterization. In substance-induced ischemia, the supporting points include substernal chest pain with a history of drug use, and we include a urine toxicology screen. In a cardiac arrhythmia, either primary or secondary from hyperthyroid, we'll see palpitations that are typically an onset that's episodic. We could also see weight loss or heat intolerance. And we see the chest pain from an arrhythmia due to the decrease of blood to the heart. Similarly, we could also see lightheadedness or loss of conscious because of a decrease of blood to the brain. We'll also have a history of hypertension and MI. And we'll add a Holter monitor and a TSH T4. In pericarditis, pleuritis, or costochondritis, our supporting points can include pleuritic chest pain, aggravated by deep breathing, and alleviated by, leaving, by leaning forward. The patient could have a history of a recent URI, and we will add an echo cardiogram. In pulmonary embolism, we'll see pleuritic chest pain, hemoptysis or a productive cough, shortness of breath, calf pain, warmth and swelling, a history of oral contraceptives or immobilization, and as we'll see in our physical exam, a positive Hammond sign. We'll add a D-dimer and CT angiography. In aortic stenosis, the supporting points include chest pain with a sudden onset that's severe, radiating to the back, and a history of uncontrolled hypertension. We'll add an ultrasound and CT of the chest. And finally, in gastroesophageal reflux disease, an atypical presentation of chest pain, we could see dyspepsia or epigastric pain that can be referred to as heartburn by the patient. We could also see early satiety or fullness and nausea. It will be aggravated by meals and lying down or at night 
and alleviated by antiacids or sitting up. We'll include an H. pylori test and endoscopy. For every exam you want to do, you want to start with hand sanitizing yourself and uh, asking permission to start the exam. So, Dr. Ebay, is it all right if I start the cardio exam? Yeah. Okay, and to start the cardio exam, you want to start off with the HINT exam. If you're concerned about a case of palpitations, you might be thinking thyroid. If there's a case of GERD, atypical GERD, complaining, presenting as chest pain, you want to see if there's any, if you could see anything in the, in the mouth. So for uh, the HINT exam, we'll start off. We'll ask them to say, ah. Uh, and a tip you want to use is you don't want to apply too much pressure when you're uh, looking into the mouth because that could uh, hurt the SP. So you just want to press gently down, ask them to stick out their tongue, and just look around and see that there's, uh, you don't see any lesions or you don't see any exudates. Okay. And while he's still uh, sitting there, we could go on and move on to the thyroid. So first thing we'll do is we could uh, visualize the thyroid and see if there's any visible lesions. And a good tip is to offer the patients a glass of water to see if it will help them swallowing. Would you like a glass of water to help yeah, swallowing? Okay, thank you. okay, so the next thing we could do is then feel for the thyroid. So we ask them to take a swallow. Okay, and we don't feel any masses, and we could do one on one side at a time. And then with the thyroid, we're going to introduce this mnemonic that we'll see again with the MSK exam, which is MSRP and uh, manufacturer suggested retail price. And so this mnemonic will help guide you along with a thyroid exam, the other components to look or to check for thyroid uh, issues. So we'll start with the M, which is motor. So ask the patient to please make a muscle and we'll test his motor strength. So he has five out of five flexion and five out of five extension. No real need for sensation like a neuro exam for the thyroid, but we're used to this opportunity to let it hold as a placeholder for cyanosis and and delayed cap refill. So we'll go ahead and look at his fingernails and you don't see any cyanosis. And we could press on his fingers and we don't see any delayed cap refill. To look at his reflexes, so we're gonna look at his biceps reflex. We'll place our thumb on his biceps tendon. And this would, uh, his normal reflex would produce a two plus response, okay? And if we were concerned for a case of B12 or hyperreflexia, he would have a three plus response. Okay, you would see that. Uh, now we could uh, assess his radial pulses as well. So we could do one at a time, two at a time if you're more comfortable, and we'll verbalize that it's a two plus pulse, regular rate and rhythm. After we completed the MSRP for his upper extremity, we can now move down to his lower extremity and we could do the same thing. His motor response on his lower extremity, so I'll go ahead and kick out for me. So he has a five out of 12 and then bend in, so a five out of five. And now for sensation for his lower extremity, we'd ask him to close your eye, please. Close your eyes and do you feel this equally? Mm -hmm. We could instruct him to relax and we'll do a patellar reflex. So a normal patellar reflex would be like two plus. And then if we were concerned like hyperreflexia or B12, uh, we would get a hyperreflexic response. So just relax and you'd see something like this. And we can continue to demonstrate with the tap on his Achilles tendon. So we'd start right here and we would, we would get a normal reflex. And if this was a case of B12 and we were concerned about hyperreflexia, he would give us a dramatic uh, response. Okay, and you feel that. I'll check his uh, posterior tibial pulse. So we'll, it will be behind the medial malleoli. And we can go ahead and do one at a time, or if you're a little more comfortable, you could do, do two at a time. Just comment that it's uh, two plus regular rate and rhythm. And while we're down here, we also want to check for uh, calf tenderness if we were concerned about a PE. So we could squeeze his calves and ask him if he has any pain. Okay, and we're going to introduce the Hammond's maneuver. So it's when you ask him to dorsiflex, please. Please uh, raise up, uh, raise up your toes, okay. and then we'll squeeze their calf, and we'll ask them if they have any pain. Please raise up your toes again, and then do you have any pain on your calf? Okay. And now once we're we finished down there, it's always a good idea to hand sanitize again. So and now we can move ahead to the cardiac exam. So for the cardio exam, a good way to do this is to degown the patient and just to help cover them up. You ask them to please hold it in this position so that it's protected and covered. First thing we want to do is vis visualize. So we'll make a comment that there's no cardiac visible lesions. And we we'll check the back and do the same thing as well. And now we're going to go ahead and palpate. So we're going to use a Z motion to just palpate and see if there's any pain. Did that produce any pain? Do the same thing on the back as well. Okay, good. And uh, now that we didn't feel any pain, we'll go ahead and listen to the heart sound. The mnemonic we want to use apartment M225A. That stands for the aortic, so we'll check that aortic first in the second intercostal space on the right. And then we're going to go to the pulmonic side. Tricuspid. And then we're going to 
going to go to the mitral. And if this was a female patient, a tip you could use to slip their breast up. Okay, you can make a comment that we heard a regular uh, audible S1, S2, no murmurs, rubs, or gallops. While we have our patient sitting up here, we could transition nicely into the pulmonary exam. So for the pulmonary exam, since we already inspected, we won't have to do that again, and we could just check for symmetrical rise. So we could ask the patient to take a deep breath, please. Good, and that was equal. And please take another deep breath. And good, that was equal. And the next thing we'll go ahead and do is we'll do percussion. So we'll start above the clavicle. And we'll percuss left to right in three spots. Do the same thing around the scapula on the back. After percussion, next thing we're going to do is go ahead and listen, and we'll start off listening. We'll switch it over to the bell, and we'll use that to listen above the clavicle. And the instructions you want to give is, when you feel my stethoscope, please breathe in and breathe out. So now we can make a comment that we heard clear breath sounds, uh, no audible wheezing. Once we completed the cardio and palm exam, uh, lying, stand, uh, sitting up over here, for economy of movement, we can now transition to the patient lying down. So we could ask them, would you, do you need help uh, lying down at all? Okay, so now we could just set the bed to 30 degrees for the uh, carotid exam. Ask them to go ahead and please lie down. Then you don't want to forget to extend the leg rest. Okay. Once we have them lying down, we can now cover up, cover them up again. And we'll start the carotid brewery exam. Um, if you could ask the patient to please look to your left. And we'll use, we're gonna use now the bell of the stethoscope to first listen. Okay, and you make a comment that there's no audible breweries. And while he's still on the side, you can now feel for the pulse. And you can comment that there's a two plus pulse, regular rate and rhythm. Do the same thing on the other side. So you could ask the patient to please turn, listen. comment that there's no audible bruise, and then feel for the pulse again, that it's a two plus pulse regular rate and rhythm. Okay, once we listen to the um, carotid uh, pulse, we could go ahead and make a comment that we don't see any visible JVD, so we could ask the patient to turn to the right again, okay, and then turn to the left, so there was no visible JVD. And then to finish up the cardio exam, we would just like to auscultate for the PMI. The best uh, position to do this in is to have the patient to lean over your left side, please. And just feel that it's not displaced at all and should be in the fifth intercostal space. So very important not to forget to auscultate for the PMI on the patient's left side and under the gown. If they were wearing a gown, we would go under the gown and we would just listen real quick. For your OSCE exams, they'll uh, put in a case of GERD or gastric, uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease uh, presenting as atypical chest pain. So if that's a presentation that you're concerned for, now would be a good time to go ahead and do an abdominal exam. So the best way to do this is while he's lying down after the carotid brewery exam is to roll the gown up. And now do the same thing. We'll inspect first and we'll comment that there's no visible lesions. And ask him if, uh, you ha do you have any pain at all? Okay. So we'll use the diaphragm of the stethoscope to, to first auscultate in four quadrants. make a comment that there's normal active vowel sounds. And then the next step is to percuss. So we can percuss again in those four quadrants. Okay, and since he indicated that he has no pain, we could start anywhere. And the first thing we'll do is we'll start superficial palpation. So we could do that with just one hand and do that very lightly. We'll try to go in three lower quadrants. So we'll do the three bottom quadrants and we'll ask him if he has any pain and you could also look to see if he winces at all. So you keep his, your eyes on his eyes. Okay, okay good. And now I'm gonna to transition to a deep, and for a deep you could just do hand on hand. 
And you could do the same thing. Let me know if you have any pain. I'll do three quadrants. Okay. They had no pain. The next, the last step we'll do is we'll check for a patomegaly. And so a good uh, way to do this is you place your hand under the, his liver span, and you can instruct the patient to please breathe in. And once they breathe in, as they breathe out, you'll move your hand to the lower edge of his rib cage. And as long as you don't feel the liver extending below that rib cage, you can make the comment that there was no hepatomegaly, which there was none. So you could cover him up, and you could ask, you could help him sit up. Could I help you sit up, please? Okay, good. And then just to conclude the exam, you'll want to ask him if they have any questions. And as long as they have no questions, I will conclude the physical exam. Thank you.